A lot of you know that when it comes to me and Pokemon, if I'm not talking about the games, I'm probably talking about the anime. And that's mainly because it was my gateway into the franchise. I have vivid memories of watching it on YTV, or if I was lucky enough to go to my grandparents' house on Kids WB. They had satellites, so we got to see some of the American channels. And for better or for worse, I still keep up with the show today. Many others who watch the show claim that it was at its best from Kanto up until mid to late Johto. Personally, I think the series was alright up until Best Wishes, but but I see where those opinions come from, and recently I've discovered that those opinions may not all be rooted in nostalgia. It may be partially because of a writer for the anime by the name of Takeshi Shudo, who was with the show from its start up until his departure in late Johto. But just what makes Takeshi Shudo stand out? Well, he wasn't just a writer, he was chief writer as well as the original series planner, setting many things in motion for the show and creating some of the show's most iconic characters, such as Ash and the anime adaptations of Brock and Misty. He was also also the sole writer of the first three Pokemon movies, which have so much to them, they deserve their own video. But before we get into what he did for the show, let's get a bit more obscure and talk about something else Shudo did for Pokemon. You see, on top of being a screenwriter, Shudo was also a novelist, mainly writing stories spun off from the shows he worked on. In 1997 and 1999, he wrote two novelizations of the Pokemon anime, covering Pallet Town up to Vermilion City. From what's been translated, there's a lot of stuff written in these that aren't present in the show so they may not be canon, but they are still quite interesting. The first novel covers, among other things, a ton of stuff surrounding Pallet Town, which, for future reference, I'll be referring to its Japanese name of Masada Town. The novel says that since Masada is so small and rural, there aren't many jobs to go around, so most kids go on Pokemon journeys when they're old enough. However, in the monthly top 10,000 Pokemon trainers charts, trainers from Masada usually linger around the bottom of the list. But over a century ago, when the town was known as Masahiro, there was a trainer by the name of Okiro Masada, or Oak Palette, who placed in the top 900 in the chart, the highest ever achieved for a resident of the town. He was honored as a hero, and they renamed the town Masada Town. The Oak family name had become well known in the town since then. Professor Oak is Okiro Masada's great great grandson, and Oak had two older brothers, the oldest of which being the mayor of Masada Town. The novel also mentions Gary Oak and how his cheerleaders were hired by the mayor himself, the boy's great uncle. Now we get into Ash's story. Ash's father left home to go on a journey right after Ash was born. According to the novel, most men in this world tend to become trainers, and it's revealed that Delia's father did the same. Both Ash's father and grandfather never appeared in the monthly trainer charts, nor did their names ever show up in official trainer registrations, so their current whereabouts are unknown. From Ash's birth to the time he turned 10, his mother was proposed to numerous times, but she turned all of her suitors down, despite not loving Ash's father anymore. The novel lists her age as 29 when Ash starts his journey, and we also learn of Ash's exact age. It's said that children are allowed to go on a Pokemon journey in the April following their 10th birthday. Ash is said to be exactly 10 years years, 10 months, and 10 days old before leaving home, having spent the last 10 days trying to come up with the pose he strikes when he catches a Pokemon. Amazingly, the anime premiered in Japan on the 1st of April, which would make his birthday May 22nd. Moving on to the second novel, we begin to see that the Pokemon world is not as lighthearted as the show makes it seem. It explains that being a gym leader is a very tough job. It doesn't pay well, government support isn't enough, and gym leaders must resign if they lose three times in a row, often leading the gym leaders to bribe challenges. This is where Brock comes in. His father also left to go on a journey, but Brock's mother had trouble keeping the gym by herself. She remarried several times, but each husband eventually left as they didn't want to deal with the troubles of managing a gym. Finally, she too ends up running off, leaving Brock to care for the gym and the family. The novel then reveals that Brock's siblings are actually the children of his mother's many husbands, and also why Brock falls in love with every girl he sees. He unknowingly wants to find a new mother for his siblings, replacing the one they never had. Though until he changes his perception of love, he'll never get to a woman's heart. It even mentions that Misty and her siblings are in the same boat, with their parents leaving as well. Also, that Misty's sister's natural hair color is black. They just wear wigs. Now, as non-canon as it all might be, Shudo's interpretation of Pokemon is admittedly very depressing. And there's even more stuff in these novelizations that I didn't even go over. But now I think it's time to move on to a lighter note and delve into what he did for the show directly. From 2005 to 2010, Shudo posted a number of blogs to his website, many of them talking about his time writing for the Pokemon anime, and several of them translated. In one post, Shudo talks about how even though he was writing a show primarily for kids, he wanted Pokemon to be something that everyone could enjoy. For a number of reasons, he was somewhat restricted in what he wanted to 
to do, but he still managed to write some great stuff. In fact, many of the episodes he wrote are considered to be some of the most memorable among Pokemon fans. Allow me to briefly go over just some of the episodes he did. See if you remember any of them yourself. Pokemon I Choose You and Pokemon Emergency. The first two episodes of the series. We get introduced to Ash, Pikachu, Misty, and Team Rocket. It all starts here. School of Hard Knocks. The gang comes across a boarding school and meets a girl named Giselle. It's notable in that it's the only episode where Ash shows a visible crush towards a girl, and we learn that Jesse and James went to this school in the past, but flunked out. Island of the Giant Pokemon. Ash and Team Rocket's Pokemon set aside their differences to find their trainers, and Ekans and Coughing explain that there's no such thing as an evil Pokemon. The Ghost of Maiden's Peak features a ghost girl, a talking ghastly, and many other things you don't see in your average episode. Go West Young Meowth. We find out how Meowth is able to walk and talk like a human, which involves taking a look at his past. Charizard's burning ambitions. Ash and Charizard go their separate ways so Charizard can get stronger. But not before Team Rocket helps Charizard find the strength on the inside too. Fly me to the moon. A Pidgey wishes to fly higher than any Pokemon's ever flown, and Meowth, sympathizing with Pidgey, wants to help it achieve that dream. Shudo even had an idea for a final episode where Pokemon revolt against their trainers, kinda like Pikachu revolts, and also an earlier concept for the third movie where Professor Oak finds the skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, I'm not kidding here, but that's all I'll get into for now. Going back to Shudo's episodes, did you happen to notice a pattern? One way or another, Team Rocket has a prominent role in every one of them, and that's because Shudo had quite the affinity for these three. Like Ash and the gang, he also created the Team Rocket trio, but since they were less of an adaptation than the protagonists, he had more creative control over them. They even have roots outside of Pokemon. James in particular is partially based off of a character from the anime Go Shogun, which Takeshi Shudo also wrote for, and he actually does resemble James quite a bit. But anyway, back to Team Rocket. Shudo gave these three the most complex personalities of anyone in the series, in the hopes that they would appeal to adults as they did kids. He also explains that while the trio work for a criminal organization, they themselves aren't bad. They just had to stop leading honest lives because of personal circumstances. They also have high self-esteem and are very independent. That's actually why they wear white suits, which are said to be self-made, instead of the usual black Team Rocket Rocket outfits to help retain their individuality and not lose sight of themselves. Shudo, along with the rest of the writing staff, considered removing them from the series by Johto's end in preparation of a fresher start with Hoenn, and it ultimately came down to either removing them or Misty. Misty ended up getting the boot in the end, as we all know, but Shudo explained that without Team Rocket, Pokemon just wouldn't be Pokemon, as well as feeling that Misty's existence was, quote, the least justified, as she was initially added to the show to appeal to girls. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say Misty had no purpose being around, but the trio really are a big part of what makes Pokemon the show that it is, and though I'm always gonna miss Misty, Shudo did make the right decision, and it'd be one of his last decisions too. Shudo's involvement with the series ended with episode 244. A lot of us wouldn't know who Shudo was until October 2010, when the news broke that he had suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage and unfortunately passed away. A rather bittersweet way to learn about his work, really. Referring back to another one of his blogs, he said he wished that he could have done more with the Pokemon series. He lamented on the fact that the elements that he did put in have been gradually fading away, and that the kids who grew up with the show have surely lost interest in Pokemon as a whole. Well, I certainly didn't. Even with the anime, it still holds my interest. I'll admit, it's not what it used to be when it started, or heck, even 10 years ago now, but it still does manage to have its good moments. Notably in the XY series, where there's actual growth in the protagonists and Team Rocket shows more human characteristics again. Something I think Shudo would have really liked to see. But really, I can only imagine how much more interesting the anime could have been had Shudo been given more leeway. And on the flip side, how it would have been had he not been there at all. So for what he did do, both for what I talked about today and for many more things yet to be revealed, I think we all owe him a great amount of thanks for shaping a big part of a wonderful franchise. So thank you, Mr. Shudo. You may be gone, but your legacy will continue to live on, especially in the world of Pokemon. Thanks for watching everybody, I really hope you enjoyed what you saw. This was a video topic that was on my mind for a really long time, and I'm finally glad I got around to doing it. So if you liked the video, be sure to like, favorite, share, subscribe, and all the other good stuff that I may be forgetting about. And if you want, you can follow me on either Facebook or Twitter so you know firsthand when a video comes out. Because apparently YouTube is like broken? I don't know. And with all that said, I will see you guys next time with another installment in this month of Pokemon. Catch you later! Oh,